the drug history podcast season one episode five drugs and the bible the bible is a collection of 66 books some or all of which are regarded as sacred text by followers of judaism christianity islam rastafarianism samaritanism and other faiths while the internet is full of debates over the authorship of some of the books such discussions are beyond the scope of this podcast. Our interest in this episode is in what the Bible reveals about the historical use of drugs in the Near East. On this basis, we shall take the Bible at face value since the stories it presents tell us something about the beliefs and lifestyles of the authors and the communities in which they were based. We start off with a continuation of a discussion we began at the end of our discussion on drugs in Assyria and Babylon. The connection between the Bible and Babylon or Assyria is found in the book of Genesis, which identifies Abram, later called Abraham, as having been born and brought up in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham is estimated to have lived around the second millennium BC. He is the acknowledged forebear of Jews, Muslims and Christians, whether in a physical or spiritual sense. At the same time, Chaldea was a region of the Persian Gulf around the second millennium BC that overlapped what was to later become Assyria and Babylon. Although Abraham himself left the land of Chaldea and settled in the region around modern Palestine and Israel, the rest of his family only made a partial journey and settled in Haran, which was likely part of the Assyrian Empire. Both Abraham's son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob, are reported to have got their wives from Haran. There are therefore reasonable grounds to consider if there was an Assyrian influence on the culture and medical practices of Abraham's physical descendants, the Jews and the Muslims. In our episode on drugs in Assyria and Babylon, we highlighted how those peoples were polytheistic and believed that different demons were responsible for different ailments. We saw that the concoctions of drugs made from herbs, plants, animal extracts, minerals or stones were administered alongside incantations to exorcise demons. There is no evidence of such practice in the book of Genesis. This might be a result of the monotheistic nature of the religion of Abraham, which appears to have been a strong driving force behind the departure from Mesopotamia in the first place. However, there appears to have been some polytheistic beliefs among those that remained in Haran. As we consider some of the substances that might be viewed as drugs in the Bible, studying with plants seems a reasonable idea. However, we are immediately faced with two plants that do not seem to fit neatly into our definition of drugs based on our understanding of medical science. The book of Genesis talks about two plants in the Garden of Eden with effects that transcend the standard physiological effects of drugs. These are the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The first of these, the tree of life, is said to have possessed remarkable repair and regenerative powers to the effect that it could make or it would make humans live forever. The book of Revelation also references its unparalleled healing properties. This is also likely the same tree referred to by Ezekiel in his vision in Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 12. On the other hand, the contextual reading seems to suggest that while the eating of the second tree results in massive harm, this arises not so much from the tree itself but from the act of disobedience. It would obviously be amazing to get a sample of the first tree and evaluate its components, finding out its constitution in terms of vitamins, amino acids, growth factors, or whatever else would produce such profound beneficial effects. However, Considering the unavailability of either plant right now, as well as the lack of societal experience with them, we shall assign the trees to a category outside the realms of this podcast. The next plant we come across used as drugs 
uh, mandrakes. They are mentioned in Genesis chapter 30 verses 14 to 16 as well as in the Song of Solomon chapter 7 verse 13. It appears that they were believed to be aphrodisiacs, fertility drugs, as well as used for their fragrance in enhancing the mood of intimacy. It appears that Jacob's wives and his descendants many years later shared this view of mandrakes held by other cultures. The 30th chapter of Genesis also reveals what may be either seen as a misinformed attempt at drug therapy or as another superstitious belief in plants held by Jacob. In this case, Jacob uses fresh sticks from the poplar, almond, and plain trees to attempt to influence the phenotype of the offspring from livestock. That he later understood the ineffectiveness of this approach and the true laws of genetics at play in terms of homozygous or heterozygous genotypes and phenotypes is seen in the explanation that he gives to his wives in the next chapter, which is chapter 31 of the book of Genesis. The other examples of references to or to the use of plants and other substances for their medicinal properties for healing, for diagnosis, or otherwise, include the following. We have the example of Moses using a branch from an unnamed tree to purify some drinking water in Exodus chapter 15, verses 24 to 25. In Leviticus chapter 12, verses 14 to 16, we see a reference to the use of hyssop in a ceremonial cleansing process for a person who has been healed of leprosy. When taken together with Psalm chapter 51 verse 7, in which David pleads to be cleansed with hyssop after his crimes, we see that this indicates that the plant was seen as antimicrobial, antiseptic, or at least as having an effective cleansing ability. The third example is Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 to 31, which contains a hard-to-swallow diagnostic test for adultery made from holy water and dust, alongside barley flour and the saying of blessings and curses. While this has some similarity to the Babylonian and Assyrian practices we discussed in our last episode, the main difference is that the blessings or curses pronounced in the Jewish setting were seen as dependent on the guilt of the individual, while the incantations of the Babylonians and Assyrians were designed to drive out supposed demons responsible for disease and illness. In 2 Kings chapter 20 verses 1 to 11, we find the story of King Hezekiah who developed a terminal illness but which was subsequently healed after application of a poultice made of a cake of fig to the cancerous boil. When we turn to Job chapter 2 verses 7 to 8, we see Job using ashes which contain charcoal to alleviate the pain from painful sores. In the book of Proverbs, we see a reference to a merry heart as doing good like a medicine, although the medicine itself is not specified in this case. This suggests, uh, firstly, that medicines and hence drugs were in general usage in order for the readers to relate to the proverb. And secondly, that at least some of these medicines were seen as a force for good. There are many references to the use of balms in the Old Testament. This is a term that covers salves and medicines. Examples of the word balm are found in Genesis chapter 37 verse 25, 43 verse 11, in Jeremiah 8 verse 22, 46, 11, and 51 verse 8, as well as in Ezekiel chapter 27 verse 17. The contextual evidence indicates that such balms were used for a variety of medical conditions, including pain management, and that they were valuable trade items. Even Jacob, on hearing news of the powerful ruler in command in Egypt, whom he did not yet know was his son, and of the events that had happened up to that point in the pursuit for grain during a drought, is said to have sent a little balm among the presents for the man. It is notable that the word used to describe the chemical treatments applied to a dead person which is embalm, 
is derived from the word BAM, giving a nod to the way in which the knowledge of chemical properties of the drugs in the embalming agents had become known. We find the use of the word embalm in Genesis chapter 50 verses 2, 3, and 26. An eighth example that you can look at is of Jeremiah, who gives a figurative reference to ineffective medicines in chapters 30, verse 13, and 46, verse 11. Finally, while it seems that the New Testament gives prominence to healing via miraculous means, it is interesting that among the miracles performed by Jesus is one in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, in which he uses clay made with his saliva. Perhaps this was an acknowledgement of the poultices that were sometimes used in healings. Having gone through the list that we've just mentioned, it would be remiss of us not to mention another drug that appears several times in the Bible, right through from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, this, you might have guessed, is alcohol. In fact, one can argue that this appears more than any other drug in the Bible. A rudimentary account of the number of occurrences of the word wine in the King James Version shows that it appears a minimum of 267 times. As such, we would need a whole series to look at the subject of wine and the Bible. If you search online, you will also find many sites dedicated to either the condemnation or support of alcohol consumption based on selected Bible references. However, it appears that many of these sites give arguments based on a superficial evaluation of the text, mainly based on the English translations of the original languages. Scholarly research suggests that the term wine in the Bible was used both for alcoholic beverages and for unfermented grape juice. In general, it appears that the favorable references relate to the unfermented juice while the unfavorable references relate to the alcoholic beverages. Among the deleterious effects highlighted as caused by alcohol are drunkenness, poor decision-making, poor behavior, numbing of the mind, alcohol addiction, and being a symbol for spiritual confusion and slavery. On the other hand, there are positive references to unfermented wine as being useful for pleasurable consumption as well as treatment for some medical conditions. There is one reference in the book of Proverbs to the use of strong wine for those who are perishing, and this has been interpreted as most likely referring to the pain-numbing properties of alcohol in an age when there were no general anesthetics or palliative drugs for those in terminal pain. Uh, having said this, one may note that many Jews and Christians seem to enjoy a tipple or more every now and then. We may in future return to the discussion of the use of alcohol in the Bible. However, it is useful to remember the current recommendation of the National Health Service in the UK, as well as a Medscape review uh, that argue that there is no safe level of alcohol consumption with alcohol being associated with high risks of various cancers, neurotoxicity, and cognitive decline, such as with dementia. We shall cover this in a future episode looking at the history of alcohol. Thanks for listening. See you next time on the Drug History Podcast.